to conserve the death of Christ. Issues of poverty reduction and job creation. Federal government starts nation silos with over 90,000 metric tons of asserted consumables as weak response to global food crisis. You're welcome again. As Christians World Uber commemorates Good Friday, Omen Kamarachuku in this report highlights the significance of the day as he takes us to some worship centers within the Abuja metropolis. Good Friday is a day Christians all over the world reflect on the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, which brought salvation for mankind. It is also part of events marking the Holy Week and help to see that we are not thinking of ourselves but we are thinking about the good of others that's the lesson about the good friday so this is the joy we are celebrating today that god gave his only begotten son to die for our sin and that is the hope that we have as christians in most of the churches visited christians are admonished to always remain faithful and committed in serving god in order to enjoy the blessings of his atonement on the cross. He gave his life for humanity. He gave his life for our salvation. We're expecting for everyone who has met Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to respond in sacrificial giving, in giving our lives for our loved ones. Give Jesus Christ, even in the midst of trouble, he has come to set us free. And I want to leave the message of hope that for Nigeria, there is hope. Christ rose on the third day, and I believe very strongly that Nigeria will rise again. But we all must work together. We must put our hands together to be able to lift Nigeria up. The congregation also used the Good Friday to pray for the unity and peaceful coexistence among citizens. In Abuja, Omeka, Rajku, NTA News. Now, still on Good Friday, joining us in the studio via Zoom is the Catholic Bishop of Auchi, Most Reverend Gabriel Dunia. Uh, sir, thank you for joining us on the News on NT International. Thank you. Now, tell us what does Good Friday represent in the Christian family? The Good Friday represents supreme sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for the salvation of the world. On our part, it represents our individual sacrifices that we must make for the salvation of our brothers and sisters in our world, anytime, anywhere, in whatever condition. Now, what makes this uh, Friday good, being that when a savior who is supposed to be honored is killed by those he came to redeem? Yes, this Friday of all Fridays and this is good because in it, the greatest gift is given to mankind. That is the gift of salvation, eternal salvation. Because himself, Christ Jesus, has said that there is no greater law than a, for a man to lay down his life for his friends. In John chapter 15, verse 13, so the greatest thing we can do for the, our fellow men and women, if we truly know God, is to lay down our lives for the service of others, selflessly, unconditionally, anytime, anywhere. Now you talked about it, salvation and sacrifice as some of the lessons of um, this uh celebration now what are the lessons can we learn especially from the persecution and then the crucifixion of christ 
when, when we are persecuted, we look upon Jesus who had already undergo greater persecutions than we are. And he has told us that no servant is greater than his master. If, he, if he, our master has suffered great persecution, our own persecution will not be compared to that of Christ. And we, if we are ready to be his disciples, which we must be, we follow his full step. That is the meaning of being disciple is to follow the full step of the master. So when we are persecuted, we, we take the example of Christ. How he was persecuted, he had all the means to command the powers of heaven to know what they were doing when they persecuted him up to the point of uh, arresting, condemning him falsely, and executed, executing him. Now, to wrap so, up, to wrap, to wrap up the discussion, when we look at happenings around the world today and reflect on them, how then do we achieve this salvation to make the death of Christ more meaningful to humanity? When we continue to teach that we, they will teach the positive uh, uh, doctrine that uh, God is greater than all the difficulties, the disaster, the calamity that are on earth. If God is the master of the whole creation, including the death, We, we, we thank you. We have to wrap up the conversation here because of uh, poor uh, signals that we're getting, I think, from your end. Um, that was um, Bishop Gabriel, Rev Most Reverend Rada. Most Re that was Most Reverend Gabriel Jr. speaking from the, Cat the Catholic Bishop of Auchi, speaking on Good Friday. Now, moving on to other stories. Humanity is at the heart of various messages on Good Friday, commemorating the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Here is the report. In an Easter message, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, on behalf of the Federal Executive Council, describes the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the manifestation of God's love for mankind, which has brought liberation, hope, and a secured future for the human race. While reminding citizens to use the Easter season to pray for peace and unity among all ethnic nationalities, Secretary to the Government of the Federation reminds Nigerians to continually adhere to all non-pharmaceutical interventions on COVID-19 and also take advantage of the ongoing vaccination program in various locations across the country. The President of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, in his message of felicitation, notes that Easter marks the trial, sacrifice, victory and completion of the divine mandate of the author of the Christian faith and urges Nigerians to keep in mind the significance of the season, which he describes as the perfect demonstration of sacrificial love to others. In his Easter message, addressed to all Nigerians and titled, Hope in the Midst of Gloom, Nigeria Will Rise Again. The President, Christian Association of Nigeria, Reverend Samson Olasupo Ayokunli, prays for Nigeria's resurrection from all her pains and challenges so that those who have suffered will eat the good of the nation. The Corps Marshal Federal Road Safety Corps felicitates with all Nigerians and Christians, calling on all motorists to ensure full compliance with all road traffic laws, saying, safety on the roads will guarantee a happy Easter. Now, barrage of Russian strikes across Ukraine after a warship sinks. Moscow warns the U.S. of Army Ukraine in a formal note. In Shanghai, residents clash with police over COVID quarantine sites and Zimbabwe crash kills 35 ahead of Easter gathering. Details with Charles Alpha on Global Update.
Russia is lashing out after the Moskva, the pride and joy of its navy, sunk to the bottom of the Black Sea, launched its first major attack on Kiev since pulling troops back from the capital. Loud explosions were heard overnight after Moscow retaliated to the sinking of the largest ship in its Black Sea fleet. The Russian Defense Ministry was forced to accept the Moskva had sunk hours after Ukraine claimed to have hit it with an anti-ship missile. Russia on Friday warned the United States against arming Ukraine, warning of unpredictable consequences as war entered the 51st day. Moscow identified multiple rocket launchers as the most sensitive weapons, although the U.S. and its NATO allies are not believed to have armed Ukraine with those weapons. In the note, Russia accused the NATO allies of violating rigorous principles governing the transfer of weapons to conflict zones. In other news, Shanghai residents have clashed with police over a nearby quarantine site. Residents of a Shanghai area that hosts research center for major tech firms fought with police over plans to open quarantine facilities near their homes, underscoring angers over the Chinese government's handling of its worst COVID outbreak since Wuhan in early 2020. People living at the Nashi community in the financial hubs on Thursday tried to stop workers in Hamzat suit from erecting fencing around several buildings that have units similar to service apartments. At least 35 people died and 71 were injured in Zimbabwe when a bus carrying worshippers to an Easter gathering veered off the road and plunged down a judge. The vehicle was taking members of a local Zion Christian church to an Eastern meeting in the south of the country. Reports suggest that the bus was overloaded. Charles Alpha, NT News. Now, technical studies and creation of forest reference baseline or monitoring system are not achieved towards the Red Plus process in many countries. But Nigeria was able to put a system in place and even improved on it. Those were the words of World Bank Practice Manager, Environment, Natural Resources and Blue Economy, Sanjay Srivastava, as the validation of Nigeria's Red Plus National Forest Monitoring Systems and Financial Frameworks here in Abuja. Haman Jabani has the details. The validation of the 48-page National Forest Monitoring System and 70-page Financial Framework has stakeholders from development partners, ministries, departments and agencies, as well as academics and CSOs. The process generated discussions on the NFMS basics, components, implication to forest stratification and mapping processes, carbon offsetting, database management, and how to operationalize the frameworks. But this is a very bold step in order to bring our international practices and best practices of other countries and bring the model to Nigeria to ensure that we do not just preserve our forests, but we get credits and payments for doing so. Give a statement, every criticism from all stakeholders were noted and they are meant to enrich the document. The clean document will be in a document that Nigeria will be using for its process of money, uh, national monitoring, forest monitoring system in the country. Working on a framework that can support all the stakeholders that are interested in carbon trading, especially focusing on the voluntary carbon markets. World Bank team commended Nigeria Red Plus for the achievement recorded over the years while calling for sustained tempo. More importance could be given to expanding the reforestation and deforestation initiative, but also try to improve the biodiversity and at least to look at the areas that are degraded and that are causing massive soil erosion and flooding and drought at the same time. The bold steps by Nigeria in the development of a robust and functional NFMS and financial framework, I believe, will tackle the challenges of deforestation and draw its benefits. Hamman Jabani, NTA News. We head to the National Assembly now, where a bill for the establishment of a new sickle cell research and treatment center suffered a setback at a public hearing held by Senate Committee on Health. National Assembly correspondent Dayo Gunshala reports 
that forefront advocacy groups and the management of sickle cell as the hearing preferred a strengthening of existing centers in the country. Among the bills before the committee are the National Health Act Repeal and Reenactment Bill, Federal University of Medicine and Medical Sciences Egbe, Kogi Establishment Bill, and the Federal School of Nursing and Midwifery, Igbe Agu Isi Establishment Bill. So we need more than ever before to produce more doctors, more medical personnel. Having a hospital on one hand is, is just to complement other specialized universities. And we will partner. We will collaborate. We will not leave it in the hands of the federal government. We are prepared. Advocacy groups, however, believe that a new research center for sickle cell will come with additional body to government. Most of the teaching hospitals have already set aside sickle cell clinic days every week to attend to health needs of people living with sickle cell. So these clinic days can be well resourced instead of establishing another treatment center. I would advise and also uh, suggest that maybe funds are made available for centers. And if you look at even the structure of the center that was proposed, the chief executive also will be appointed by the president. The chief medical director will also be appointed by the president. So you have like a teaching hospital where you have two uh, chief medical or chief executive officers. If passed into law, the National Health Act Repeal and Reenactment Bill will empower the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health, to preside over affairs of National Council of Health in the absence of the substantive minister from the National Assembly, Dayo Gunshola, NTA News. This is News at 7, reaching you live from Abuja, Nigeria's capital city. Time now for a break. We return with more stories. Do stay tuned. Take to get ahead in today's world. To get your dream job. The perfect girl. Even a table at your favorite dance club. It takes moving fast. It takes moving at the speed of 4G. With Intel 4G LTE, you've got it all covered. That's because you have access to super fast unlimited data that enables you move as fast as the speed of light. Now, no download is too heavy. No conversation too long. Nothing is impossible. Get Intel 4G LTE Advanced today and do so much more. Intel. Live more. Board members of the National Directory of Employment and the Michael Imudu National Institute for Labor Studies have officially assumed duty after being inaugurated by the Minister of State, Labor and Employment, Festus Kayamo. Emmanuel Anyimiru quoted the minister advising the new boards to formulate policies that will lift Nigerians out of poverty, create wealth, and not to interfere in the day to day running of the organization. To undertake assigned tasks. The measure of independence given to them, however, has a price. Effectively pursue the attainment of quality service delivery. They also have the responsibility for meeting targets, introducing broad policy measures for seamless operation and supervising the management to ensure that targets are achieved. While the National Directorate of Employment is involved in using labor to create wealth, the Michael Imudu National Institute for Labor Studies is to sustain labor education. I am sure that the new boards will facilitate and fast track the optimum and more effective implementation 
of the respective mandates of the two agencies. We are going to work very closely and sincerely and truthfully and honestly with you. With this, the coast seems clear for fresh initiatives on how to turn the two agencies around for good. Emmanuel Ayemiro, NTA News. Now, for meaningful de developments to happen, governments at all levels must accord, must continue to accord priority to matters of youth developments as well as national unity. Nigeria's former head of state, General Yakub Ngoan, stated this as the inauguration of the NYSC television and radio stations at the NYSC headquarters here in Abuja. Oleg Hauju was there. The National Youth Service Corps scheme has been on the news, both for the good and bad reasons. This is about to change with the inauguration of this media outfit. Thank you all. Thank you all. Being a multifaceted media station, it is designed to further advance the course of the NYSC as well as serve as a training ground for youth core members with the aim of enhancing and sustaining the capacity of the scheme. They will serve you know, as veritable tools for, the, for driving our quest for national unity, cohesion, and purposeful development. Even before the licensee came through, General Shaiko had acquired all of the equipment that he needed for transmission. And this will in turn contribute to the gross domestic products through the exposure of the NYSC skills acquisition and entrepreneurship development training, as well as other programs of the scheme. They will educate and entertain, give the scheme a stronger voice to showcase the programs and sensitize Nigerians on the policies of government in addition to the promotion of national unity, national ethos, as well as values and orientation. With most of the workforce expected to be to offer, Olayin Kaoju, NTA News. Meanwhile, the federal government says it has stocked the country's silos with 90,000 metric tons of assorted food items. This is based on the United Nations recommendation that countries should keep substantial amounts of food in case of emergency. Musa Aliu has more. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations recommended that countries should store 12% of food that will at least last. Nigeria has been abandoned out of which 70,000 metric tons were released during the COVID-19 lockdown as directed by President Muhammad Buhari. That we have already released that during that time. We have already restocked restock some of our silos and still doing. It is from the available food items that 40,000 metric tons is being released for distribution to vulnerable Nigerians. We have about 90,000. We are releasing 40,000. And if and when another need arises, we will release again. As we speak, Mr. President has approved uh, additional funding for restocking our silos. We are currently restocking even as we are releasing. A total of 50,000 metric tons of food items are still available in the silos spread across the country with plans by the ministry to restock after this year's harvest. Musa Aliyu, NTA News. And in other news, the Nigerian Navy Forward Operating Base Ibaka, the local government area of Akwaibom State, has impounded a total of 300 bags of 50 kg suspected foreign boiled rice within a week. Security of the waterways. So as much as these criminals would not stop to operate in the waterways, we would also not stop to make sure that we catch up with them and arrest them and hand them over to a necessary prosecuting agency. Who oh, they? The rightful thing by taking the consignment to uh, Calabar uh, government warehouse where they would be kept there for safe custody. The forward operating base had on Friday, April 8, handed over 70 bags of 50 kg foreign paboard rice and two suspects to the joint patrol team, making a total of 300 bags within a week of operations. From Ibaka, Mbu local government area of Akwaibom State, Kelvin Samo, NTA News. Sports update is next with Ayodiji Makinde. 
Team Bayosa has emerged winners of the first National Para Games, which held at the Moshud Abiola National Stadium, Abuja, with a total of 93 medals comprising 31 gold, 30 silver. To make we proud at, at least to show or showcase us. 15 sporting events were competed for in the week-long event, with 21 states participating. Moving on to football, ahead of the third round of the FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup qualifiers, head coach of Nigeria's Flamingos, Bankole Oluwokere, has declared the readiness of the team to face their counterparts from Egypt. 20 players have been selected, including two goalkeepers, seven defenders, 11 midfielders, four midfielders, and seven strikers. Uh, like a one or two uh, training section to I'm a play with uh, some uh, finishing touches to our uh, program. Whereas I'm telling to you, we are, we are almost ready to. Meanwhile, the Egyptian delegation, which arrived at Abuja Thursday, will have their first field of the Moshud Abiola National Stadium on Saturday, ahead of the clash on Sunday with the return leg in Cairo come April 30. Still on football, Nigeria's Flying Eagles have been drawn in Group B alongside Ghana and Burkina Faso, ahead of Wafu B Under-20 Championship in Miami, Niger Republic from May 7 to 20. The seven-team championship serves as NTA News. And that ends the news telecast. Thank you for watching. I'm Lami Ali. Anna Olenka has been the sign language interpreter. It's a sick, though men and children aren't entirely left out. Sadly, these crimes are perpetrated by intimate partners and family members. Yet, it's one of the most underreported crimes worldwide. Thank you for joining NAPTIP on the move. My name is Angela Agbegi. Welcome. <laughs> Our focus on this episode is domestic violence, DV for short. What constitutes domestic violence? And what is NAPTIP doing to curb this crime? Don't go away. It's NAPTIP on the move. Every year, millions of people all over the world become victims of domestic violence. So while we talk about the issue of domestic violence this is an issue that transcends geographical boundaries it's not something that is peculiar to the nigerian or rather the african society it transcends gender it happens to both men and women it transcends race it happens to africans black americans caucasians it transcends class it, you know, it, it happens to bourgeois, it happens to middle class, it happens to the lower class. And um, it is something that when we look at statistics, the issue of domestic violence is something that is common all around the world. But the difference is some countries have been able to stem that protects women behavior in a relationship that is being used to control an intimate partner. So the action word is here is a pattern because it's not something that is one off. 
it's something that happens over and over and over again and the main goal of that behavior is to intimidate or control an intimate partner the various forms of domestic violence include physical violence harming you know somebody also you or you know looking down at that person you find instances where you're telling somebody the person is stupid or the person is worthless the person is not good enough also name calling you find partners giving their 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 intimate partner demeaning names then we also have um sexual abuse and this is when you intentionally um, have sexual intercourse with your partner even though they don't want it and for us in in nigeria we don't recognize what is termed as marital rape because marital rape in a marriage is termed as you know sexual assault but then over more than 50 countries including the united states the united kingdom nepal even south africa you know recognize a marital rape the economic abuse so this is when you intentionally stifle somebody who ordinarily deserves um, economic support from you for instance you don't give your spouse uh, money to run the home or you don't pay school fees you don't pay the rent if you have a mortgage you refuse to pay that mortgage and in the case of nigeria cases of domestic violence is on the rise when we also look at our records especially our call center which is just one of the reporting channels that we have here in naptip we get more calls for domestic violence and we actually get calls from um, trafficking in persons and most of the calls most of the complaints or the reports we get in naptip regarding domestic violence they border on physical abuse so mostly battery it also borders on ec um, economic abuse you know when spouses don't want to care for their families or they abandon the wife and children and it also borders on psychological um, abuse the effects of domestic violence are enormous it causes post-traumatic stress um, disorder it's not only people who are involved in, in a war situations that actually get uh, ptsd survivors of domestic violence also experience ptsd and they experience ptsd see they develop um, trust issues they also develop um, substance abuse and even some of them become suicidal because of the kind of horrors they've been through um, in their life domestic violence can be trans generational so children who um, grew up in a, an abusive situation also grow up to be abusers themselves or they grow up to be attracted to abusive situation and that happens if they don't get early psychosocial help in their life because to them when you grow up in a home where your father is always punching your mother your mother is always punching your father there's never peace you now grow up seeing it as being normal so children that grow up in that system grow up to be aggressive when they go to school you know they yell at their 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 classmates because to them they feel it's it's um it's normal napjib has intensified efforts to curb incidences of domestic violence we have a department distinct on its own to handle cases of domestic violence napjib recently launched a survival mentorship program the survival mentorship program is a mentoring program by survivors of domestic violence. The idea is that they are going to help us send the message out and also help us to tell survivors of domestic violence that there is hope and they can bounce back and still move on with life regardless of what has happened to them. Um, NAPTIP is mandated to implement the provisions of the violence against um, persons prohibition act we have a unit called the rapid response squad 
So basically the rapid response squad, they respond to emergency cases of domestic violence and um, sexual violence as well. Um, they report to me directly. The VAP Act also provides for the appointment of a VAP coordinator. So last year I appointed a VAP coordinator and basically the task of the VAP coordinator is to coordinate all issues of domestic violence in the, the FCT. Then the VAP Act also provides for the deployment of protection officers to the six area council of Abuja, which was something I did in January. So I was able to identify 12 officers, you know, from different departments, the working peers, so two per um, area council so that they can, they can work in, in, in shift. And basically their work is to um, assist the courts, assist the police, and also assist um, uh, service providers in carrying out their duties under the act and also to assist the victims. Like for instance, if they need to ac access um, service providers like NGOs, the protection officers are supposed to facilitate that. If they need to access the courts, the protection officers are supposed to facilitate that. If they need protection orders as well from the courts, because there are instances where people don't feel safe. If you don't feel safe in your home or you, you know, the, the perpetrator is probably stalking you or it's, Pre-2015, our shelters only catered to victims of trafficking in persons, but with this added responsibility, we've expanded it to also cater for um, victims of dom domestic violence. Because when people are caught in domestic violence situations, the first thing is to remove them from that situation for them to be safe. And that is what we do. So at our shelter, we of course provide a roof over their head we close them we feed them we provide uh, medical support we also provide um legal um assistance in the fct the fct judiciary just recently um appointed four judges that will um that will that will try sexual and gender based um, violence cases in the fct which is a very fantastic and a, you know a good development and what that means is sgbv cases will now progress faster the agency's rapid response squad has been strengthened for effective service delivery the dg ensured that the rapid response unit which i had the report directly to her and once the sense of that to ensure that there is no uh, encumbrances like the rapid response we ensure that there is rapid response to cases of arrest you rescue victims and not only that one you ensure that there is the diligent investigation and diligent prosecution there's visibility of the agency and because of the visibility cases come in their dozens every day DJ has made it so clear that please this is my work go after these perpetrators ensure that they are brought to book and whether they are high-profile cases, DG doesn't bother. Our own is that let justice be served. 627 is a short code that anybody, whether you have credit or not, you, you will always make a call. Unlike where you now have to begin to think, which number do I even call? 627 is so easy that somebody can even look at it and you know, remember. And when you call that, it is 24 hours. And mind you, the 24 hours means that we also work 24 hours. A rapid response unit will never turn, we don't turn over our phones. Underreporting of domestic violence cases is a challenge. The biggest complication for us here at NAPTIP is that people don't report. There are different reasons why someone will not want to report a case of domestic violence, possibly because they are embarrassed and um, pressure from family and also. Uh, stigmatization people will say oh look at that woman that her husband is always beating and all that if it takes you a month to report that's fine but the most important thing is survivors should know that there is a system 
it has been put in place to protect them and that whenever they are ready to speak up they have a place to 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 go for us here in naptip we have a lot of cases where women report domestic violence we start our investigation and all of a sudden the right to say they want to withdraw the case we also have cases where people say they rather you know settle out of court than take the perpetrator to court so these are the reasons why we actually have a very low number of convictions in naptip coupled with the fact that it is very tasking and it is very difficult to prove domestic violence in in court or even rape we all know how difficult it is to prove rape and when you talk about um maybe emotional abuse except if that person has been documenting this abuse from the one it is difficult to prove in court which is why when people come we investigate and we tell them oh you don't have a pri prima facie case they feel maybe naptip is compromised or naptip don't do no we don't use emotions even though this is emotional when you hear stories like this you cannot help except if you are inhuman as long as you are human you can't help but being emotional but the the law does not recognize emotions the law recognizes facts and the law is not for that christmas it will not give you what you don't ask for so we have to ensure that we do our investigation we have a prima facie evidence that you know, we can take to court that is the only thing that can set us up for conviction the sexual assault referral center is a one-stop shop where victims can access help uh, sexual assault referral centers were established to address some of the gaps in support services for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, whether male, female, or, or child, boy or girl. Um, they have been designed to provide immediate emergency medical treatment, medical examination, document injuries in a structured way, um, build up medical reports that can support effective prosecutions of rape cases in court, but not only that, to also provide trauma counseling to survivors and provide advice and support for them to navigate the legal system, and provide support for them to interact with police investigators and to also navigate the justice system. Sexual assault referral centers have been around in Nigeria since the first one was established in 2013 in Lagos, the Mirabel Center. And what the rule of law and anti-corruption program um, funded by the European Union has been trying to do is to build upon um, the numbers of centers that we have, you know, were established in 2013 and to expand that number, replicate that number across many more states because you want a situation where a state that has um, a very densely populated state like Lagos, for instance, or, or possibly UB with a big landmass, has more than one sexual assault referral center to serve, sufficiently serve the population. You also want a situation where the centers are accessible enough and located within state-funded hospitals where um, citizens can easily access it. You want a situation where all the other coordinating agencies like police, like the Ministry of Justice, the Office of the Public Defender, you want the DPP's office, and you want a variety of stakeholders who also have a role to play in coordinating STBV response to also be able to access um, the center or at least access its staff and access documentation as appropriate. Um, since we started uh, supporting the expansion of the SAC initiative, in 2017 when the rule of law and anti-corruption program started and we have been able to expand that number from the original nine centers that existed at the beginning of 2017 to um, what we now have as 32 sexual assault referral centers across 19 states in nigeria and the idea is that that number will continue to grow uh, across the 32 centers that currently exist these 32 centers have assisted over 25,000 survivors of sexual and gender-based violence across the 19 states. Sexual assault referral centers provide services free of charge to survivors. Um, and that's one of the 
the cardinal um, pillars of the service is that it should be free um, because we want to make it as accessible as possible to as many citizens as possible. NAPCHIP collaborates with diverse stakeholders. We have FIDA. FIDA is the uh, Female Lawyers Association of Nigeria. They are very, they are, in fact, they are one of our partners. They refer cases to us all the time. We work together, we collaborate on projects. They are very progressive, they are very responsive. You know, they don't take issues of domestic violence um, lightly. So that is one channel that survivors can, can access. We also have the National Human Rights Commission, who they deal on issues that has to do with human rights. Domestic violence is a rights issue, so people can also access that. Then we'll have the Legal Aid. That's the Legal Aid Council of Nigeria. They have a widespread across the country. They have offices there. They provide legal assistance to indigents who want, who do not, who cannot afford to go to court. So they provide that that support. Then we also have an organization called the Pro Bono, Pro Bono Clearing House. Pro Bono Clearing House. They also work on cases of domestic violence and you know sexual violence. Then of course we have a lot of NGOs that work in this space. So there are so many entry points, there are so many responding agencies that um, survivors can, can access. Cases of domestic violence should be reported to save lives. I'm encouraging all to save this number. Call 627. It's a toll-free number and we have officers on ground 247 to take up these cases. When we get these cases, trust us that we will do the need to speak up and speak out. You cannot at the verge of saving your marriage and your life is being threatened. You cannot take away the fact that a lot have died, a lot of lives have been lost in the guise of saving the marriage. No one is after having a bad marriage or having